So some of you may know me, some of you may not know me. Um, and I really feel like God has placed a, a powerful word for us. Uh, but before we get into the word, I want to uh, share a little bit about myself, me and my family. I think we have some pictures. Let's start off with my amazing, beautiful family. I was going to say wife, but yep, you guys see it right there. That's me, that's Stacy, um, that's Dominic, that's Zoe, and my son DJ, who is 19 years old. He is actually studying kinesiology at Fullerton, so I'm extremely proud of him um, and, and all that good stuff. And I think we got some more uh, individual pictures. That's baby Dom right there. That's my little, uh, my little Spider-Man. <laughs> um, that's Zoe. Zoe is six, going on 26. Uh, she is always asking me questions about marriage and when can she get a husband and all that stuff. And I'm like, hey, just, just don't awaken love too early. Hold on. <laughs> um, and this is my beautiful, gorgeous wife, Stacy. Um, man, I love me some Stacy. <laughs> so that, that's a little bit about myself. And oh, there, that's my son again, me and DJ. We took some pictures in the summer before he went to college. Um, he dyed his hair. He's rocking the gold chain like his dad. You know, all that good stuff. Um, but I've been married for about 11 years. Um, love it. The first year uh, was really hard. And then when I started following God's plan for marriage, it got a little bit better. Um, again, like I said, I have a 19-year-old, a 6-year-old, and a 2-year-old. Um, I've been pastoring for about 12 years. I was a youth pastor for five years at Calvary Christian Center. Um, and then I was a young adult pastor for about five years at the same church. And then recently, about two and a half years ago, um, God called me to Real Life Church to, to serve alongside Pastor Dean uh, at Real Life Church. And we are seeing an, uh, an amazing move of God at, at our church as we have one of the most uh, multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-congregational churches um, in the Sacramento region. So I'm excited about that. Can we, can we give God a round of applause for all those good stuff? Well, let's, let's get it into the word. If you have your Bibles, um, go with me to 1 John chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading from verse 7 before I share um, my, my message uh, topic. And just want to shout out all those that are watching, watching from the dorm room. Uh, God bless you guys. I know you, you couldn't be in here with us uh, this morning. Uh, still love you, and I hope you get something from this word. Um, let's get into the scripture. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone say, love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Everyone say, God is love. And then there's another passage in 1 John chapter 4. It says, if someone says they love God but hate their brother, they're a liar. And I'm paraphrasing because it's impossible to have the love of God and hate your brother or your neighbor. And what, what I want to talk about today, which I think is very important, is from the topic of anchored in love. Say that with me. Say anchored in love. The reason why I think it's important to talk about love and talk about how to be anchored in love because love is not a temporal concept that derives its origin from man. Love is an eternal quality that originates from God. I'm going to say that again. Love is not a temporal concept that derives its origin from man. Love is an eternal quality that originates from God. In other words, everyone can be created by God, but not everyone is born of God. This is why the Bible says you must be born again, right? Your, norm, your normal birth was of, of flesh and blood, but your spiritual birth is of spirit and water. And according to 1 John 4, it's saying that God is love and everyone who loves is born of God. So in order to love or be anchored in the love that God wants you to be anchored in, it starts with us being born again. Now, if you are a born again believer, you have the capacity to love on a level that God wants you to love. If you are a born-again believer, you have the ability to love your enemies. If you are a born-again believer, you have the ability to forgive. You have the ability to, to reconcile offenses. You have the ability to fight through bitterness. You have the ability to, 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 to forgive and let go of things that God wants you to let go. But the question is, it's not that you can't do it. It's, it's are you willing to do it? And this is important because if we are not anchored in love and we begin to uh, get our definitions of love from um, man and get our definitions from love from other religions and other uh, 
other places that tries to redefine and, 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 and re, reintroduce a new version of love, if it doesn't come from the creator and you're getting your definition of love from creation, then chances are you, be, you can be getting a perverted version of love. Because if love derives from God and God is the creator of us, that this means that we have to look into scriptures to see what love is. Can I get an amen? Now, uh, love can mean so many different things to so many different people, right? Oftentimes, we get our versions or our definitions of love from our experiences, whether they are good, whether they are partial, whether it was a manipulative experience, whether it was a codependent experience, whether uh, it was a tradition that our parents passed down to us, whether it was uh, from our upbringing, our well-meaning people, we all have somewhat of our version of love, what we think it looks like. But God is very specific in what the love that he has for us and what that looks like. You guys interested in wanting to know what that is? Come on, come on. Now, before I answer the question of what is God's love, I thought this was pretty interesting because we're talking about anchored. We're, we're, we're in a season, we're in a theme where we're talking about being anchored. And I think Paul prays a prayer in the book of Ephesians. He says, I pray, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19, he says, I pray that from the glorious unlimited resources, he, speaking of God, will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. His spirit of what? His spirit of love. Then it says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him, as you trust in that love. Your roots will grow down into God's love, right? Roots anchored, those can be somewhat of a synonym. If, if you're anchored in something, if you're rooted in something, that means you're steadfast in it, you're, you're immovable, that you're planted in that. And Paul is saying that I pray that your roots will, will, will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. As all God's people should. Raise your hand if you're a part of God's people. All right, okay, cool. <laughs> For those who didn't raise your hand, let's, let's pray the salvation prayer over them in Jesus' name. <laughs> it says... As, as all God's people should, right? What, what should we know about love? Paul is saying that you would know the width, the length, the height, and the depth of this love, that you may experience the love of Christ, that it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul is saying you step into the fullness of who you are supposed to become when you know the revelation of who God called you to be through his love. You can't have God's promises without having his DNA. You can't have the plan of God without the path of God. And God has prearranged, predestined, uh, uh, preset victory and breakthrough and promises in the believer's life. But it's in the path of love. It's not in the path of our versions of love. It's not in the path of the traditions of love that got passed in us, passed down to us. It is in us understanding what God's love looks like. How do I walk in the love of God? A pastor calling you to be a leader, calling you to do amazing things. But it will always be through the path of love. You can't go around to a different path and try to access God's plan. His promises, his way. Somebody say that to your neighbor. His promise is his way. The human's heart, true home, is in the presence of God, which is the presence of love. Your heart finds its home. Your heart finds rest. Your heart finds peace. Our, heart, our hearts finds joy when we rest in the presence of God through love. Your heart won't find rest in a girlfriend. Your heart won't find rest in a boyfriend. Your heart won't find rest in revenge. Your heart won't find rest in being a, a victim. Your heart won't find rest in gossiping, in bitterness. Your heart will find rest in forgiveness, in the love of God, in the promises of God. That way you can access the joy of God and the peace of God. Now, I'm not against girlfriends and boyfriends as I had one to become married to my wife. But what I'm saying is when we begin to outsource to humanity things that we should only source to divinity, we will begin to have frustration in our life. God has to be number one. God has to be first. And when we keep God's first and we walk in his plan of love, our heart will find rest. 
Could it be that you are restless? Could it be that you are still anxious? Could it be that you're still dealing with self-esteem issues because you have not done what Paul have uh, prayed over you in Ephesians 3, that you come complete and full in knowing the love of God so that you can step into the fullness of God? That answer to Ephesians chapter 3, that when Paul says, I pray that you may know the width, the depth, the length, the height of the love of God, so that you can be filled with the fullness of God, we can find that answer to what is the width, what is the length, what is the depth, what is the height of the love of God. We find that answer in Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 35 through 39 says this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does, he mean, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, are persecuted or hungry, are destitute or in danger, are threatened with death? For your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, Paul speaking to believers, and at this time, in this context, context, people were being persecuted. They were dying for the gospel. And he says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Not even a broken world, not even uh, uh, divisive uh, uh, things happening in our world, not even a pandemic. Nothing can separate you from God's love. God calculated the enemy's plans to harm you when he predestined his plans to bless you. Oh, Jesus For today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ, that is revealed in what Christ purchased for you. Christ purchased a plan. Will Christ's death access God's provisions over our life? Jesus became what we deserve so we can get what Jesus deserves, which means you don't have to perform for love. You don't have to, to earn love. You don't have to try to, 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 to be something you're not for love. You just receive love. You receive it by receiving Jesus. So the question is, what is the love of God? As I said earlier, it takes an infinite God who has no beginning or end to fulfill a heart that essentially has an infinite desire that's never satisfied. If the heart is a bottomless pit, always wanting, and when you get it, it wants more, it's never satisfied, God is the perfect match for your heart. Not your soulmate. I heard a pastor say this, which I'm going to say it to you guys. I wish I thought of it. They can't be your soulmate if they didn't die for your soul. Selah. <laughs> Selah. We're not looking for a soulmate, young people, young adults. We're looking for a destiny mate. We're looking, or we are resting that God has someone, and we're doing our due diligence, but we don't have to try to work to find a soulmate. Guess who your soulmate is? Jesus. When you find Jesus, you find the only person in the world who can perfectly, completely, unconditionally love you. Now, as much as my wife loves me and as much as I love her, I, it's, it's impossible for me to love her in the way Jesus can love her. This is why it's important that you be bonded to God's love before you try to be bonded in a romantic type love. You have to get your vertical connection with God right before you try to get your horizontal connection with other people right. Because if you don't get the vertical part right, the horizontal part will keep frustrating you and keep making you mad. But because I had a vertical connection to love, I was able to be resourced and know who I am, not lose who I am, not give up my conv convictions, not give up my values, when I find somebody I like, I was able to stand in who I was because there was a God in heaven who validated me, who loved me, who wants me, who, who made me perfectly the way I am. So I don't have to change to be something I'm not to get somebody who may not even want me. If it hurts, say, ouch, because it's a little quiet in here. <laughs> so if God is love, then the correct definition of love can only come from him. 
if God is love, God doesn't have love. He doesn't distribute love. He doesn't uh, 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 come in and out of love. God is love. His essence is love. So he is the generator. He is the source. So how can you give love in the world if you're not connected to the God of love? You have to be connected to love in order for you to distribute love. There's a lot of people trying to give love, but they're not connected to love. This is why we got people trying to redefine what marriage is, what marriage and family is. They, they, they have their versions of love, but they're not willing to see what the creator has to say about love. 1 John chapter 4, what is love? We're going to answer this question right now. Ask me, say, what is love? For the true love of God is this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, or chapter 5, verse 3, excuse me. For the true love of God is this, that we do his commandments and keep his ordinances and are mindful of his precepts and teachings. I'm going to simplify it. True love of God is obedience to his word. Now, if you have some authoritative issues, if you have some submission issues, you don't like that word obedience. But you have to understand something. I know some people have used the word submission, and some people has used their authoritative uh, position to mishandle you, to mistreat you. But submission was never supposed to be something that should be demonized. And rebellion was never something that should be glamorized. It was one man's rebellion, Adam, who took humanity and put him in a bad place with God. And it was one man's submission, Jesus, who surrendered to the plan of God and restored humanity back to God. So, of course, Satan is going to try to make rebellion look good and submission look bad but submission is not about a choice it's more about an attitude submission is a good thing submission provides protection and well when you submit to God's word I'm not saying submit to foolishness I'm not saying submit to deceit not saying submit to seduction but when you know God's word for yourself and you submit to that plan of love it provides protection it provides provision it provides peace it provides promises and most certainly it provides promotions because his plan for your life has already been set you just have to step in what he's already created he, I, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it uh, um, what, what, you know, God created us, but when he created us, he already fulfilled the plan of God that he has for us. So basically, when he created you, when he created us, we're starting what he's already finished. So when I came into this earth and I arrived as a baby and I'm walking as a baby to a, to a child, to an adolescent, to now an adult, my whole life is st- starting and locating what God already finished over my life. He's already declared what you're going to be. He's already set it in motion to what you're going to be. He already has the plans. How do we know that? I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. God already had a plan for you before you were even in conceived. See, that's love. As a father, it is an indictment on me as a dad. As you guys heard me say, I have a 19-year-old, a 6-year-old, a 2-year-old. It is an indictment on me as a dad if I don't prepare for the needs that my kids may have even before the needs present themselves. Before they need clothes, I'm already buying them clothes. Before they need security and confidence, I'm already pouring that into my kids at a young age. Before they need food, the refrigerator is already stocked. <laughs> Before they need candy, I already have a jar full of candy for them. (laughs) What I'm saying is, as a dad, if me as an earthly father know how to love my kids, how much more will your heavenly father know how to love you by providing a purpose for you, by providing a plan for you? He has what he's already intended for you to be. You just have to submit to that plan. So if Jesus is the standard of love, then that means we got to look at Jesus' life to abstract how can we walk out this path of love. Now, I was reading something, and I thought it was pretty interesting. Excuse me. Not only does Jesus represent God's love towards us, right? The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? He sent Jesus as an example of his love. But Jesus being fully God and fully man From the God side, he's representing the love of God. But from the human side, he's showing us how to respond back to that love. Oh, Jesus, did y'all catch that? 
Jesus is not just demonstrating God's love towards us, but he's also showing human beings how to demonstrate their love back to the Father. See, oftentimes we just look at God's love is just in Jesus, but Jesus has shown us how to respond back to the Father with a life of obedience, with a life of surrender, with a life of being dedicated to the plan and the path and being anchored in the love of God. Somebody say anchored in his love. Jesus was a bridge. Now, you know what I've learned? When you're a bridge, both sides will walk all over you sometimes. When you're a bridge for this group of people, and you're a bridge, a bridge for this group of people, and one side is trying to tell you to cancel the other side out, and the other side is trying to say cancel the other side. But guess what? In the kingdom of love, in the kingdom of God, there is no cancellation of people. There is cancellation of sins. There is cancellations of, of, of things that God want, wants to get rid of your life. But we, as people of God, I'm not saying that you got to keep people in your life that are unhealthy and unsafe but we can't cancel people. When you walk in the love of God, there is no cancel culture in the kingdom culture. The only cancel culture in the kingdom culture is the canceling of sins, the canceling of mistakes, the canceling of our past, because in Christ we are a new creation, which means no matter how bad somebody may be, the love of God could possibly transform them into who God always created them to, uh, to be, if you guys are tracking with me. Say so there is no cancellation of people. I think some of you guys don't like that. <laughs> so I want to read something. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Now, this is where I want to go a little bit deeper, why this is important. It says right here, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? The greatest of these is what? Why is the greatest of these Love, the most important, because if your definition of love is off, then that means your faith will be off and your hope will be off. So if you don't have a correct definition of love, then now you will put your faith in people more than you do God. If you don't have the correct definition of love, then you'll put your faith and hope in systems more than you do the kingdom of God. See, the greatest of these is important because love is the motivator. Faith is the activator. When you have the love of God right, then your faith is properly placed with God. Your hope is coming from Jesus. Your faith is in Jesus. Everything that, that motivates your faith, your hope, is coming from a pure source that can be trustworthy. But when you don't know the love of God, then you start getting uh, bits and pieces of versions of God's love but not his real love and this is why the Bible says a wise man builds his house upon the rock and a foolish man builds his house upon the sand the reason why it's foolish to build your house on sand because all sand is is particles bits and pieces of rocks so when you build your life on bits and pieces of truth and not the full counsel of the word of God not the fullness of Jesus not the fullness of God's love your life will not be founded on something solid so when the storms of life comes when different different things is happening in the world has come you're easily shaken because you're not anchored in God's love you're not rooted in the love of God you're not rooted in, in, in God's love. You're not rooted in the faith and the hope that comes from Jesus. These are qualities, faith, hope, and love, that are not necessarily man-made qualities. These all originate from God. If there is such thing as uh, false hope, because when you put your hope in things that are not true, when you put your hope in things that are not pure, you can have a hope that will make you deferred. And the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Some of us have been hurting internally because we placed our hope in things that never was able and capable to love us in the way that God could love us. Can I get an amen? Am I speaking to anybody right now? So Satan... His agenda is to try to tempt you in thinking that God's motive of love or God's motive is to keep you from something. Let me, let me say this a little bit better. When we were in the garden of, or not when we, when Adam and Eve was in the garden, Satan tried to repose a question to them. Did God really say you'll die? He tried to get humanity to doubt the motive of God. God says, I set before you in the garden the tree of life 
in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Choose life. You know, God is like, choose life. But Adam, or not Adam, Satan tried to allure them by making something that God didn't want them to choose to be attractive. And he tried to get them to doubt God's goodness. Satan will always try to get you to doubt how effective the love of God is. Satan is always going to try to get you to doubt, is forgiveness really effective? Is loving my enemies really effective? Because Satan has been defeated and dethroned when you choose the path of love. The greatest warfare to the kingdom of darkness is love. Love connects me to all of the provisions and the, and the weapons of the kingdom of God. Love connects me to angelic power. Love connects me to uh, peace and righteousness. Love connects me uh, to joy. But if Satan can get me out of the love of God, then by default, I'm fair game for his attacks. Can I get an amen? Do we have that graph on the, um, that, I, that I sent you guys? It's like a, yes. Can you guys see this? Is it big enough? I can't really see it. So you see, Jesus, when he came, he brought love. The Bible says the law of the spirit of life has freed us from the law of sin and death. What does that mean? You were born into sin, shaped in iniquity. So therefore, when Christ came, he brought a new law to where if you get born again, now the law is love. The law we walk in is love. Love God, love your neighbor as unto yourself. So when you walk in love, you get access to the blessing. You get access to faith. You get access to healing and deliverance. You get access to prosperity. You get access to the peace of God. You get access to angelic support. But when you choose to not love on the level of God, what happens is Satan brings fear. He brings sickness and disease. He brings poverty. He brings worry. He brings hate. This is why he's always trying to manipulate you out of choosing God's love because if he can seduce you away from truth, if he can seduce you away from God's word, his love, then he can now uh, attack you legitimately in areas. Can I get an amen? So love, everyone say love. Love is a daily surrender. As I'm closing, I want to, one of the, the, the biggest lies that I think sometimes we accept is that my ability to feel is more powerful than my ability to choose. What if I told you love, the love of God is not necessarily a feeling, it's more of a choice. I don't always feel in love with my wife. I don't always feel like doing things for my kids. I don't always feel like loving people who didn't love me the way I felt like I should be loved. But in the midst of what I don't feel like doing, because I'm born again and because I have the spirit and the nature of God in me, I don't have to go off what I feel. I can go off what I've read, what I've studied, what I meditate, and I can choose God in the midst of feeling not like choosing God. See, in the first garden, Adam and Eve surrendered the willpower of man to Satan. When they hearkened to the voice of the enemy, humanity was trapped. They were always falling into sin. And now God didn't no longer reside with us. He lived outside of us. That's why God represented himself in a cloud, in a fire. He was intense because he could not yet live inside of the human heart because sin had not been dealt with. But what first Adam gave up, which is what our willpower, what we lost, Jesus redeems our will. And when you look in the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't know if you guys read your Bibles, there is a passage where Jesus is praying, take this cup away from me, but not my will, your will be done. And the Bible says he was sweating as if it was great drops of blood. What is he doing in this moment? He is redeeming our will to choose God's will. Oh, Jesus. He is redeeming humanity's will to surrender back to the will of God. He didn't want to go on the cross. He said, take this cup away from me. He didn't feel like being obedient, but he chose obedient. He demonstrated what love looks like when you choose God through obedience. And because of Jesus' obedience, one of the greatest injustices known to man, Jesus dying for something he didn't do, it brought about the greatest justice known to man, all of humanity being reconciled back to God. 
When you are anchored in God's love, you see that love is powerful. The greatest man in history had no servants, yet they called him master. Had no degree, yet they called him teacher. Had no medicine, yet they called him healer. Had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. This is what happens when you are anchored in love. Father, I just thank you for the word that went forth. God, I just pray right now that as we heard your word, God, I pray that it will not fall on deaf ears. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive. Lord, I just pray right now that as they are thinking about areas where they can be anchored in love, Lord, if there's some decisions that have been in the balance and they weren't sure what was your direction, God, I just pray that this word, that your spirit right now is clarifying your direction for their life. I come against every satanic and diabolical assignment trying to blind the minds of the people of God, trying to blind the minds of anybody in this room. And I just pray that the veil will be removed and they will see the love of God clearly. God, I pray that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, that we would know the hope that is in our calling, the hope that is in the love of God. And I just thank you for being done right now, Lord. I speak and declare blessings and peace. Lord, I declare joy instead of mourning. I declare praise instead of heaviness. I declare beauty instead of ashes because we are surrendered to your love. In Jesus' name, amen.